Hello, thank you all for joining us in this, which is the second in a series of webinars that discusses Linux State products, their features and their applications. My name is Tom Pritchard, I'm the host for today's event and I'll be introducing the webinar and also rounding up at the end. This particular webinar is entitled Introduction to Limit State Ring. It's going to provide you with a bit of a flavor about Limit State Ring, which is our masonry arch analysis software, uh, just telling you what it does and how to use it. The main part of the webinar itself will run for approximately uh, 50 minutes until about 10 o'clock, and that will include 10 minutes at the end for questions, which can be posted via the chat functionality, which you should be able to see in the webinar interface. Uh, we'll try and answer as many questions as we can in the time available, but it's not always possible to get around to all of them, and I do apologize in advance if we don't get around to actually answering your question. Um, I know we have a bit of a mixed audience today. Some of you will have used Limit State Ring before, and some of you will be quite new to it. I'd ask if anybody has uh, any specific questions regarding the software, which might require maybe a long or a considered answer to contact us outside of the webinar itself via info at limitstate.com and we'll be happy to answer any of these questions in detail for you. Our speaker today is Professor Matthew Gilbert who is the Limit State Ring product manager and I'll pass you over to him now. Thank you. Um, so it's, this is an, a preliminary um, introduction to Mason Rock Bridges. Later on in the webinar series we'll be having a more in-depth look at um, the more advanced features of the software and the more um, complex behavior that you can uh, see in, in the case of Mason Arch Bridges. Um, first of all, say a few words about Limit State in case you're not familiar. Um, Limit State was spun out from the University of Sheffield in 2006. It's basically commercializing academic research. It's providing engineers with uh, software that um, can be used to analyze the ultimate limit state. And the key thing is we're taking advantage of different technology, we're using optimization technology in order to um, achieve that. And partly because of our university background, I guess, we're particularly keen on ensuring the software is well validated as well as being robust. And as we're a, a company, then clearly we're, we're responsible for supporting the, quest, the, the software and making sure it's, uh, it's easy to use. So in terms of um, the bigger picture, if you look at the engineering analysis and design software markets, then um, there are kind of two extremes. Is it working? Um, looking at one hand traditional software, um, so automatic hand calculations, um, uh, which kind of been around since the 1940s. Um, so for slope stability, for example, if you look at a geotechnical example, then you have automatic hand calculations, which perhaps are embodied in a spreadsheet or in a simple software program. Um, on the other hand, we could be uh, um, looking at advanced tools based on, for example, non-unified elements. And the problem has been there hasn't been a happy medium, there hasn't been uh, a mainstream tool which uh, is simple to use like traditional tools but provides much of the power of, of, of finite elements and the like. And what we're trying to do at Limits Day is, is basically bridge that gap by providing mainstream tools which are based on what we call computational limit analysis. And the idea is that you, you get many of the benefits of, of both traditional and advanced uh, techniques in doing so. And that could apply to uh, slab analysis. It could uh, apply to um, um, masonry arch bridges, which is clearly the, the interest uh, in this particular webinar. Okay, just a few words about uh, Limit State Ring. The first version uh, was, was launched in 2007, and it builds on software that's been developed um, since probably the early 90s. Uh, the first public version was available in, I think, 2001, and the software is now 
<coughs> widely used by um, large companies in, in many, many territories around the world. Limit State Geo is another software product um, focusing on geotechnical analysis. You can see in this example we get a clear indication of the mode of failure and that's one of the hallmarks of Limit State software. Again, this software is used uh, by many large companies worldwide. Okay, so in terms of content, um, I'll basically look at the basics, look at uh, analysis using limit state ring, theory and validation, um, application and some examples, and actually probably uh, um, we won't have a lot of time to talk about railway loading, but I'll, 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 I'll touch upon one or two examples um, where we have railway loading um, towards the end of the, uh, the webinar. Okay, so masonry arch bridges, um, what do we know about them? Well, first of all, we know that there's um, a very large number of, of spans around the world. The vast majority of them are 100 years or more old, and we need to assess those structures regularly. Part of the, the problem with masonry arch bridges is there's lots of obscure terminology associated with them. So um, we have um, intrados and extrados, which is the inner and outer surface of the masonry arch bridges, bridge, arch barrel, should I say. We have what's called a spandrel region which um, contains backing and backfill material in order to provide a, a, a level road surface. And then we have these spandrel walls. Um, so first thing to do if you're new to masonry arch bridges is, is really be, be very clear about what all the terms are. And they're quite nicely illustrated on this, uh, this, this, this diagram here. Next thing, I suppose, if you're new to masonry arch bridges, is get an understanding of how they how they work structurally. And probably the most fundamental bit of work in the field was carried out um, by Robert Hooke in the 1600s. He basically used uh, or developed what's called a hanging chain analogy. And so the idea is that if you suspend all the voussoirs that you have um, available to build your masonry arch bridge from a, a weightless cable or, or chain. You look at the profile that that cable or chain takes up. You invert that. And if you're able to fit that entirely within the thickness of the masonry, then you can be assured that your, your structure, your, your arch will stand. If you can't, then conversely, then when you construct your masonry arch, you'll find that the, uh, the structure um, is liable to be uh, unstable and liable to collapse uh, under its self-weight alone. This, this profile that the, um, the hanging chain or, or cable um, inverted takes up, we call the line of thrust, the line of compression. And there are many potential locations that the hanging chain or cable um, can um, take up. So there's no unique location for the line of thrust except at the um, point of failure, which we'll come to in a minute. And it's a quite a nice experiment from the, the 19th century, actually, which uh, um, explains this. This is uh, William Barlow, and basically he, he demonstrated that you could um, construct a voussoir arch with, with timber blocks between the voussoirs and you could basically remove all but one of the timber timber blocks between the voussoirs and your arch would stand. And so what I'm doing now is uh, very crudely with the mouse is actually uh, highlighting a potential set of blocks which would uh, lead to a stable solution. And clearly there's many combinations of um, pack locations which, which also allow the, uh, the structure to stand. So clearly the big message is that there's no unique solution. So an arch in the field 
um, potentially um, there are many load paths which are perfectly admissible and which may, may change over time. They may change seasonally as the abutments move slightly inwards and outwards. But if we apply a, a large load on the structure, that for example, uh, in this case we've got a, a load roughly at the quarter span, then we get a limiting line of thrust and we get to the point where we can only just fit a line of thrust within, entirely within the masonry and this is a unique line of thrust. If we apply any more load, then we get hinges and we get collapse of the, uh, the structure. And this is just a, a little example of a, an arch, it's actually a building arch which is uh, was at the point of collapse and they've helpfully infilled it so uh, it doesn't actually completely collapse. So another way of viewing um, Hooke's work is to say that shape is important. So the shape of the arch in re relation to the pattern of applied loading is what governs stability. So making sure that you have an accurate representation of your, your arch in any analysis is pretty important. This is actually quite a quite an old example now, but it's one of the um, uh, the bridges that I, probably about ten years ago I, I, I looked at in association with a, a UK local authority. The bridge is represented on the left. The model is shown on the right, and you can see that it's quite a, a, a disparity between the the real shape of the arch and the the model. What the model indicated was that this structure was not safe to carry live loading and in the report <coughs> the conclusion was that this bridge should be closed to traffic because it wasn't safe. Now clearly if the model's right then the conclusions, sorry if the model's wrong the conclusions from the model are also likely to be wrong and so uh, hence the, the findings in that report uh, were clearly pretty much uh, valueless. If you represent this, this bridge correctly, the shape of the bridge correctly, then you'll get a completely different conclusion. So what, what I would say is that if you're going to assess a masonry arch bridge, make sure you get the, the shape as accurately as you possibly can uh, recorded. In the same way as if you were analyzing a beam span, you'd make sure you have the flange fitness, the overall depth, um, those are clearly of fundamental importance. Similarly, the shape of the arch is important for a masonry arch bridge. Um, however, the masonry arch barrel certainly doesn't operate in isolation. In most cases, there is backfill material or masonry surrounding the, the arch barrel, which uh, generally provides increased um, load carrying capacity. So in this case we have um, soil pressures which will restrain sway of the arch. Potentially we have um, dispersal of the live load through the, the fill material and also we have the, the self weight of the fill itself all three of which act to um, provide additional resistance to applied loading. And this is a 2D representation. Clearly, in reality, there's a third dimension which uh, also uh, potentially provides um, um, an uplift in, in load carrying capacity. Another thing to think about and that's something which uh, we, we, we take very seriously um, at uh, the University of Sheffield and at Limit State is the issue of defects. So 
perhaps isn't too clear, but um, the figure on the left shows a multi-ring brickwork arch where we have ring separation. And what that means is that the rings have become delaminated and we end up, instead of having a single hinge forming at, in this case, the intrados, we end up having hinges forming in each individual ring. We do have some frictional resistance, some inter-ring frictional resistance, which provides an increase in capacity. But the fact that the hinges form in each individual ring uh, significantly reduces the load carrying capacity of the, uh, the bridge. So the key issue, if you've got a multi-ring arch bridge, uh, to take that into account. The middle um, image is a view from underneath a bridge where we have spandrel wall separation. So we have basically the outer edge of the bridge, the spandrel, becoming uh, separated from the main part of the, the arch. And then another example is potential for, for mining subsidence where we have uh, relative movement of the um, of the supports, and clearly here the shape is uh, very very um, badly distorted. Okay, so what tools do we have at our disposal when it comes to um, analysing masonry arch bridges? Um, well. Rather like the um, figure I showed earlier on, where we have hand calculation to the left-hand side and um, finite element analysis at the right-hand side, here we've got masonry-specific um, tools. So, for example, we have the MEXI method, which has been used for many, many decades to provide a quick and easy way of estimating the capacity of a masonry arch bridge. The nice thing about that is you don't need many input parameters. Uh, the less good thing about that is that it ignores many input parameters which we know have a major impact on capacity. So in, in, intrinsically, you don't get a particularly uh, accurate um, indication of um, carrying capacity. And it's also not a particularly good um, predictive tool. On the other hand, you can increase the complexity by turning to finite elements, for example, where there's a whole host of models you could you could create or, or, or use a, a package which um, directly represents masonry arch bridges. Um, downside is tend to be quite computation expensive, so it takes quite a while to get a result, and also quite demanding of the operator. So what we're focusing on here is a middle way using limit analysis and using limit state ring. And what we try to do, and um, you'll see later on how successful you think we are, is actually move into the simple territory in terms of ease of use and also move into the what you might regard the advanced um, sector by um, allowing, for example, local parameters to be edited. Um, so, for example, you can, you can locally change the, the properties of individual masonry blocks, etc. And that's something that normally you'd expect only to be able to do in something like finite element analysis. Okay, so let's move on now to actually doing an analysis using uh, limit state ring. I'll just uh, see if I can um, switch over to using the, uh, the software. So um, when you use the software, you're, you're faced with a, a wizard. And the, the, the idea is to allow you to use the software to get a, a quick estimate of the load carrying capacity of the structure. So 
first of all, the question is, are you dealing with a highway bridge or a railway bridge? Um, and there are other various uh, details of the um, location, etc., of the structure that you're dealing with. Um, then, geometry can be entered, and as I mentioned, geometry is, is, is critically important when it comes to masonry arch bridges. In the case of limit state ring, you can enter details of um, an end standing abutment, um, or you can assume that the, the outer spans ha are founded on effectively rigid supports. The next thing is to um, define the details of the individual spans. So, for example, you can choose whether the software uh, um, models a, a stone fusoir configuration or, for example, a multi-ring configuration. And also, there are various choices as regards to the shape of the arch. So, if you're your structure looks to be um, segmental in form and in advance of doing a more detailed geometrical survey you could simply use the uh, segmental profile in which case you would need to enter a span and a rise. You then can indicate how many spans you have or whether you've got an additional span to model so I'll, I'll check that box and if I do, then the next dialog allows me to specify the height of the pier. So, for example, I could say that it's a 3.5 meter high pier. I can specify whether the top and the bottom are um, the same width or, or whether um, there's a difference. I can change the number of blocks, and also I can I can set backing above the um, the pier if I know that to be uh, to be present. The next span is automatically the same geometry as the previous one, but I can change it and I can carry on adding spans uh, in this way if I have many of them. Um, then move on to the right abutment. Um, I won't bother to, to model that explicitly, and I won't bother, in this case, to, to, to place backing above um, the um, abutment in this case. I then um, come to definition of the surface fill. Now, what you can do is you can enter as many points as you like. So if you have um, good survey data and you have um, an undulating road or, or, or railway, less likely I suppose, then you can enter um, all the details of that here. And you can also define the presence of um, highway, road base, sub base, and you can provide different load dispersion properties later on for that material as opposed to the, the main backfill material that surrounds the, the arch barrels. In this case, I'll, I'll keep things simple. I'll maintain a, a horizontal uh, road or rail surface. The next dialog here allows us to um, specify partial factors. So depending on the assessment or even design code that you're working with, you can choose to um, apply partial factors to the materials and also to the loading. The other alternative is to set these as unity and then look for a global factor at the end and check that that global factor um, meets the requirements of the particular code of practice that you're, you're working with. So here I'll keep these, uh, for simplicity, as, as unity. We'll then move on to materials. Um, basically, there's lots of, of scope in this section to, to specify different properties for 
for example, the span masonry as opposed to the uh, pier masonry. So sometimes you have a bridge where you have a brickwork arch barrel and stone voussoir piers. So you can enter different properties for each of those um, um, areas of the bridge. In terms of um, what properties we can set, we can set the unit weight and we can set the compressive strength of the masonry. We can also specify a coefficient of friction and we can choose to set a different coefficient of friction for radial and circumferential sliding between masonry blocks. So the circumferential um, friction, here called interring friction, is only actually applicable if you've got a multi-ring arch uh, bridge. So that gives you an indication that we can model not simply hinged, hinging failure mechanisms, we can also model sliding failure mechanisms as well. In terms of the backfill, um, basic geotechnical parameters, so unit weight, angle of friction and cohesion, and we can also specify whether or not we're modeling the anticipated effects of that backfill material. So basically, does it disperse the load um, and do, do you get uh, restraint from the surrounding fill material as the arch barrel tries to sway um, into that surrounding soil? And by default, there's quite conservative parameters set for the soil and dispersion and passive pressures are switched on. So the reason that most of the default parameters are conservative is to ensure that if you're doing a quick estimate of the capacity of your bridge, that you can be assured that the, the outcome is likely to be conservative. So in the absence of detailed data derived from um, intrusive surveys, for example, then you will be likely to get a conservative um, estimate of the, the capacity. Um, and finally, on this materials tab, we can specify um, different properties for the um, dispersion properties of the surface layer. So, for example, if you have um, um, a near surface slab, for example, then you could provide um, for that by having a large um, angle of dispersion. Then move on to loading. Then, basically, there's an inbuilt one kilonewton axle, and there is also a vehicle database which you can use to um, insert predefined vehicles into your model, or you can make your own vehicles and you can access those um, via this uh, vehicle database button as well. So what I will do, for example, is um, let's suppose I'll use a, an EU vehicle. So it's a double axle, 88 kilonewton per axle, and the axles are 1.3 um, meters apart. And what I can do then is select that and click finish, and I have my bridge model set up with a load applied to it. And all I need to do to get a solution is click the green button at the top, and directly I will get the um, predicted failure mechanism, and I will get the um, ad what's called an adequacy factor shown in the output window, output pane, as you can see there. So the adequacy factor is the multiplier on any applied loading that you, you have. So in this case, the adequacy factor is 2.89. So that means that I need to multiply up the axle load by 2.89 in order to get collapse. And 
what I can do is I can um, drag my vehicle and I can explore how sensitive the bridge is to the location of the the vehicle and it's quite a nice way of um, getting a better understanding of how your bridge is working and what I would do is I'd recommend that you do that um, even if later on you run the br vehicle across the bridge which is the other alternative um, to do that then you would go to analysis, sorry, go to um, tools, loads, and click add load cases. And what I can basically do is move the, the load across the bridge. Um, and if I do that, then I can see the load cases that I've got. So there's each load case is at a different location. And when I click solve in that case, it basically does an analysis for for each of those uh, load cases at the specified spacing. So I'm finding here that the um, adequacy factor is basically 2.8. So we were pretty close with our first analysis, um, and uh, we've got comp more confidence after doing the um, additional um, analysis with many load cases. Okay, so I'll just go back to the, um, um, the presentation so you can see the um, um, how what's happening behind the scenes in order to get the, that result. So basically we're using optimization to get the the results, so it's, it's rigorous mathematical optimization. So for the configuration of blocks, we're getting the rigorous critical failure mechanism. There is no possibility of any other mechanism being more critical. And the other thing is we're we're validating um, against test results, which we'll come to. The user interface is designed to be used in two ways. The first way I've demonstrated. It's a way of rapidly getting an estimate of capacity. The second approach is to build into your analysis detailed considerations derived from, for example, a intrusive investigation. And we'll come to that a little bit later. Um, just a, a quick note about where the software fits in as regards to various industry guides, etc. Um, there's a UK organization called Syria, which some years ago produced a guide on masonry arch bridges, and they um, indicated that uh, it was quick and reliable, and we, we agree. <laughs> and a significant improvement on basic limit analysis formulations where there are only a limited number of failure mechanisms considered, and where ad hoc assumptions are, are, are made very often to identify the locations of those um, critical hinge positions, etc. So how does it work? Um, basically, the live load is dispersed through the fill onto masonry blocks. The blocks are separated by contacts, and it's at the contacts where we can get crushing, hin hinging, sliding, etc. Arch movement is restrained by um, self-weight, as I mentioned, and also by passive resistance. And the passive resistance is actually modeled in limit state ring by backfill elements. And these are elements which resist movement of masonry blocks into them, but do not um, transmit any force when blocks move away from them. And so they turn blue in the former case and they stay gray in the latter case. And this screenshot gives you an indication of the various uh, 
objects that we, we're dealing with in a, in, a, in a ring analysis. So you can see those backfill elements um, that are blue when we have this relative movement between the masonry um, uh, such that the, the soil has been compressed. Other issues, we've got um, the hinges shown in red, we've got a thrust line shown in blue. Actually, it's a thrust zone. The thickness of the thrust line um, is drawn in relation to the strength of the masonry. In this particular case, the, the masonry is, is strong, so the thrust zone is relatively um, um, narrow. Also, we can see the ax an axle and dispersion of the, the load from the axle onto the, the masonry arch barrel. So, how do we find a solution? Well, of all the permissible equilibrium states or lines of thrust which fit within the arch geometry, so we know those are, there are many of those. Of all those equilibrium states, we use optimization to find a one that corresponds to the maximum load factors. That's a multiplier on some external applied loading. And that will be also um, the load factor that corresponds to the formation of a, a mechanism. So what we're doing in the context of, of, of plastic limit analysis is we're finding the exact solution, so one which satisfies both the lower and upper bound um, theorems for the configuration of blocks that we model. In terms of mathematics, what we're actually doing is for each block, and I've grabbed a block in this um, slide from the pier, we're looking at equilibrium. So we're looking at equilibrium in the, the vertical, horizontal, and rotational sense. So that's the equilibrium. Uh, relationship, and we're also imposing what we call yield conditions, and the yield conditions are basically um, that we have um, a sliding yield condition and also a, a rocking yield condition as well. So those are imposed for contacts rather than for blocks and the quantities at the contacts are the normal force, the moment, and the shear force. And so the normal force and the moment together um, prescribe whether the rocking yield condition is satisfied, and the normal force and the sliding components define whether the, um, the shear yield condition is satisfied. And it turns out this is a an easy problem to solve mathematically. Um, just uh, going back to uh, the era of black and white photographs, <laughs> actually this is it's not that old, it's the, the early 1990s, the, so the software was actually developed in parallel with a series of um, tests carried out um, 20 odd years ago, and what we were wanting to do at the time was to have a, an analysis tool which would help us understand how masonry bridges worked, but conversely, um, the masonry arch bridge tests that were carried out at that time um, are able to, to validate the correctness or the, um, the reasonableness of solutions from the software. So we carried out single span tests and also multi span tests. And we correlate to the um, analysis results against the experimental results. So you can see in the, the final column that we don't always get perfect agreement, but that generally we're in within plus or minus 10, 20 percent of the, um, the solution. Um, one slight, slight warning um, note here, in the case of bridge 5-1, this particular bridge was built using multi-ring brickwork construction but with a fresh mortar, a good, good mortar between the rings. Nevertheless, the actual load carrying capacity of this structure was reduced 
due to the onset of ring separation. So as a result of that, in this particular model, we didn't model, uh, include that, we end up overestimating the capacity. And that's a danger in the field as well. If you model a multi-ring arch but don't um, include ring separation, then there's a danger that you overestimate the capacity. And here's some slightly more recent results. These were tests carried out in, in Salford. And the nice thing about these tests is we were able to have almost perfectly two-dimensional um, conditions in these bridges, and we end up getting within, in this case, 5% of the um, experimental um, collapse load. So and here's, here's, a, here's, a, here's a view of, this, uh, of one of those sulfur bridges where what we're really doing is building the bridge in a large fish tank, and we're able to see inside, see how the, the arch barrel and the soil are interacting. And actually, these tests are ongoing, um, and it's part now of a, a quite a significant program of work which uh, we'll be running for the next uh, couple of years or so. Um, on a different scale, there was a paper published in the Proceedings of the Institution of Civil Engineers, um, um, 2012, which um, described tests on very small scale structures where we deliberately remove some of the anticipated beneficial effects of the backfill. So for example, we remove load spreading in, and passive resistance in this, this top example. We remove just load spreading in the second one and so on. And very, very um, good correlation between the, um, the ring predictions and the experimental results were, were obtained in all, all of these tests. It's actually more than three. I think there were seven in total. So that's how it works. That's um, how we verify the software. How can we apply it? Well, two ways of applying it. One is as a quick assessment tool, perhaps as a replacement to MEXI. Or the second way is um, in a more refined, detailed way, taking on board local bridge-specific um, properties. If I go back to my ring analysis, what I'll do is I'll just um, I'll just delete those um, load cases. So delete all but the the current one. So now if I click solve, we can see we've got this failure mechanism, which involves um, actually only a single span. It's not the critical one. I think the critical one was where we had um, the load a bit nearer to the um, the crown of the the arch. Two point eight. So that's right. Two point eight oh eight. So that's roughly at the right place. Question is, what if this structure was actually crossing a river? And let's suppose that we've got washout of mortar at the base of the pier. With traditional tools, you might need to put in uh, mortar loss as a global parameter. In this software, we can actually um, simply select the, the relevant um, courses of masonry, and we can say what that um, mortar loss is. So you can now see that the, the mortar loss has reduced the um, effective width of the pier. And if I solve, and then now the hinge cannot occur as close to the extremity of the pier as it could before. And we end up reducing the load factor from 2.8 to 2.55. Um, um, so we can carry out this kind of sensitivity analysis very, very easily. We can change many, many local properties of, this, of the, the, the structure using this kind of um, 
kind of approach. Um, once we've done the analysis, then we can we can generate a report which um, can be passed on to to the client um, or, or stored for for, for record keeping. Um, haven't had time to, to dwell on multi-ring arches, but if I'd have chosen in that wizard to construct the arch barrel of multiple rings, then I would have um, actually got a pretty good representation of what we see in the laboratory when we constructed um, an arch barrel with multiple rings with a debonded uh, inter-ring uh, mortar joint. So we actually used damp sand between the rings. So we didn't have good adhesion. So we ended up getting this um, formation of hinges in each individual. Um, ring as you can see there and in this case um, we're showing also the locations of hinges and also uh, as I said I wouldn't have much time today to talk about railway bridges but we can um, model railway loading um, as we've got demonstrated here and the way railway loading works is that the dispersion of the load is um, is well the, the locations of the sleepers are taken into account in dispersing the load, and we end up with a quarter of the load dispersed through an outer sleeper. Half the axle load um, is is um, assumed to be uh, transmitted through the, the central sleeper, uh, sleeper, and a quarter through the uh, the sleeper at the other edge. So we can model railway loading. Um, using this uh, this kind of approach, we can also model um, unusual failure modes. So I go back to the, uh, the software. If I just open up a one that I was um, looking at earlier, this is um, the bridge in question. Um, you can see that it's actually got very short pier, stocky piers. So conventional wisdom has it that if you've got short stocky piers then you can model that structure as a series of single span arches. This analysis shows that probably that isn't a sensible thing to do because what we have in this case is interaction between the loaded span and an, an outer span. And so we actually have four hinges forming in the loaded span. We have backing material which transmits force across um, above the pier through the, through, the, through the backing into the adjacent span which then pops up. So the inference is that you should really model as much detail as you can when you um, uh, a modeling, for example, a multi-span structure. Okay, um, probably I um, haven't got time to talk much about um, uh, about what's new in, 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 in version 3 and it's probably only of interest to people who've used um, earlier versions. So probably now would be a good time to um, move on to questions. Um, if you have any uh, questions, can you um, just, just enter those into the chat window? So uh, I'm just looking now to see uh, what questions uh, we have. OK. OK, I've got a question. Um, the difference between version 1 and version 3. Okay, so version 1, um, that was actually a version that was made available by the University of Sheffield. It's before the, the time of uh, um, limit state um, ring. Um, I think many of the things that we've, we've just demonstrated in this webinar could, wouldn't have been possible um, 
with um, limit state um, with, with, with the original version of Ring. So, for example, there w was no interactive user interface, so it wasn't possible to um, to select and locally um, edit um, the, the, the properties in the way that we've we, we've we've just seen. Um, there are a number of other features of the software which we'll be covering in later webinars, which also um, clearly not present in version version one. So, for example, there's ability to model support movements, to to model the presence of reinforcements, um, the um, ability to have an automatic effective width, which I haven't illustrated, but perhaps I I could very briefly. Um, if I go to project details, I can auto calculate the effective width. Um, I just rotate in 3D. Um, so basically, um, actually, I just probably easier if I if I just turn those um, load cases. Off, it's makes it easier. So basically, you can probably see that as I move the the load, then the width of the bridge increases, and that's because the code requirements indicate that the distance below the load um, influences the effective width that you can um, um, assume. So when we're at the crown, then we have the minimum effective width. So that's well, just give you a flavour of some of some of the um, um, enhancements. Okay, um, I think we're running out of um, of time. Um, Ah, okay. Question: Are there notes to accompany the webinar? Um, yep, we can um, we can send out the the PowerPoint, and um, um, it's also it's a recording of the webinar in case uh, you have a colleague who might be interested and wasn't able to uh, to join that um, today. Um, okay, so I'll getting towards uh, the end of the, the, t the time period, so I'll just hand you back now to, to Tom Pritchard who will just um, um, wrap up the uh, proceedings. So thank you Matthew and thanks everyone for listening, uh, as Matthew said we're now near the end of the webinar and hope you found it informative. For people who are the current users of the software we hope that you learned something new about it and that you maybe didn't already know. Uh, if it's prompted any questions, then if you could just please get in touch via the usual routes, which are either to telephone us or to email support at limitstate.com, and we'll be happy to help. For those of you who aren't current users of Limit State Ring, we'll be in touch over the next few days just to get some feedback, find out if you have any further questions about the software, and see whether you think it might be something that would be useful to you. Um, Everyone here may also be interested to know, and I think Matthew may have touched on it, that there's some other webinars in the near future and going into next year that will sort of look further into Limit State Ring and some of the functionality and what you can do with it, uh, focusing on particular problem types and applications. So if you're interested in those, then please look out for the event notifications that we'll be sending out via email, and they'll also be posted on our website, which will be at www limitstate.com slash events. Uh, finally, I'd like to say thanks to all of you for listening, and I hope that you can join us again for one of the future sessions. And that's it. Thank you.